Hello, everyone. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome to panel six, uh, Textures of Play. Uh, as always, uh, if you have questions as they come up, please post them in the Q&A uh, part of Zoom, or I will try to watch um, Discord as well. Uh, it will go in the order as um, the schedule allows, and just reminding everyone, uh, all the panelists to try to keep things to 15 minutes, and I will give you time checks in the chat. So without further ado, we will start with um, Pather, Charles Callahan. Uh, uh, just Pather is fine. Pather? Okay, sorry. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I'm just giving, I'm just doing what's in my script. Uh, <laughs> With the paper right. dealing with main players and quarterbacks through game design decisions, a case study of cybersecurity uh, of a cybersecurity seminar game. Take it away. Okay. First of all, let me make sure that I'm sharing my screen okay. And hopefully it's coming up fine. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, I'll introduce myself to start with. My name is Pather Callahan, and I work uh, for the University of Tallinn. Uh, in their digital learning games program, uh, which is one of the more interesting games programs in Europe, as that while it does focus on digital games, it also has a huge influence on uh, working through physical games first. So uh, it, it emphasizes the design elements of games rather than just the coding element, element, which is what kind of brought me to chat with all of you guys here today. I'm currently doing a PhD because I'm crazy and because I enjoy reading for play, pain rather than reading for pleasure. And my PhD is focused on cybersecurity training games. And to do that, I've built several cybersecurity training games. Uh, the two most recent ones were in conjunction with a NATO Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Defense. And uh, basically, both of those games have taken traditional war game methodologies and added fairly simple game mechanics over the top of them to help the player to go that little bit deeper and that little bit more in depth with what it is that we're attempting to study through using those games. Uh, the the first for a second and sure. just uh, your slides aren't in full screen. Yeah. Let's see if I can zoom slideshow. There we go. How's about that? Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Edmund, and uh, sorry for that. Uh, so as I said, both of those, the games that I've designed, the first one uh, from this year was uh, uh, working with Locked Shields, which is a large hybrid game uh, with 1,500 participants worldwide. And I was part of an update that we did to a seminar war game for that. But the one that I want to talk about was the one that I ran in May, which was examining trust in a simulated cybersecurity incident. Now, the major difficulty that we had and we had to design for is that the players all come from military and very hierarchical cultures. And this can be a big problem when people start playing. In terms of, uh, in terms of the quarterbacking problem or the main player problem, even when we see it in Dungeons and Dragons or in traditional role-playing games, it comes from there being a kind of power imbalance. And power imbalances happen a lot in hierarchical societies and hierarchical cultural areas. The, basically what happens is one player uses sort of out of game authority to kind of direct and channel the flow of the game rather than allowing the players that are engaged with it to come to their own conclusions, make their own mistakes, things like that. Um, you'll often see this happening with uh, newbie players versus old hand experienced players who will over teach the game when they are first coming into it. And it's even more prominent when you have a system where 
the game that you're designing is being used in some regard to decide whether or not somebody is going to be progressed further up a military chain of command or whether or not somebody is going to receive the next promotion or not. So it really does interfere with the utility of the game for learning. And I come from the learning game side of things, the serious game and learning game design of things, which is slightly different than just the uh, entertainment side. Now, if we think about the utility of games, the people that always come to my mind are Marshev and Popov, uh, the semiotics of games, 1984 or 83, I can never remember the year. But they identified three functions that serious games always or almost always fulfill. Educational functions, research functions, and operational functions. In educational functions, there, there are two areas that tend to be compromised by people attempting to quarterback or, or become the main player or suck all the attention to them. And the first is a training function. If you're endeavoring to use a game as part of a training idea or a training concept or things like that, you have a situation where you require everybody to be making their own decisions and learning the training experience rather than just following the lead of one individual. It also can impact motivation and motivation is a huge issue. It's not nearly as much fun to play a game if you're not playing the game, you're just doing as you were told. You're just following the, the orders of somebody else. When it comes to research, quarterbacking kills creativity. You're no longer asking for answers from the entire group. You're just mining the information from the one person. The same thing when it comes to planning. Uh, the game itself is no longer about a collaborative planning framework or an experiment that is happening. It's about the idea that one person has of the game system and how they push it together. So there are certain conditions that really support uh, quarterbacking problems. And the first is contradictory. It's cooperative play versus competitive play. Uh, quarterbacking only tends to occur when the goals are set together. Um, if you are playing competitively, it's unlikely that you will be quarterbacking and telling somebody how to beat you. Not unheard of, especially with the aforementioned noob versus uh, old hand situation. But again, it's less likely. Um, we do see two types of quarterbacking or main player activities. The first of it is that if it is a cooperative team-based game, you have the quarterbacking where the person inside the game is trying to take effect, or you have coaching where people who are outside the game are still trying to push their influence onto the game and the game behavior. Both of these are pathogenic uh, pathological in terms of the, the outcomes of the game. The next thing is a full game state knowledge. If a player can, uh, I remember myself, I was playing a pandemic and I was trying to see if this person does this, followed by this person doing this, followed by this person doing this, then we have this outcome. And I was running through all the potential outcomes to try to figure out the best solution. And I was treating the game as a puzzle rather than stepping back and allowing my fellow players to make the decisions that they felt was, was the correct one. And this was an, a light bulb moment for me when I stepped back and realized I was doing it. But if I can see the full game board, I understand exactly how all the moves are going to make, especially if I think that I've seen a solution that other people have not seen. That encourages people to engage in quarterbacking. Again, as I said, the power dynamics cannot be 
underplayed in in this sort of environment and in these sort of uh, uh, in these sort of behaviors. The ability of somebody to say, "I am an authority, and you should listen to me," can be toxic to the game itself and can stifle debate or discussion. And the final one is high goal-driven behavior. If the player is focused on, we must secure this outcome above all else, this is the one thing that we need to do, all other uh, considerations are secondary, then we have a situation which is going to be rife for quarterbacking, rife for people taking over those situations. So with all this in mind and realizing that I was going to be dealing with a high level of uh, cultural bias towards this, I decided it would be easier to change the system than it would be to try to talk to the players. Because the system itself, if you change the environment, you're going to change the behaviors that are occurring within that environment. And we did this in a couple of ways. First of all, we set up each character had a role card with a hidden role on it, with a group victory condition and then a hidden victory condition for all of the people who are playing. They did not know what the other person's hidden victory condition was. And this produced hidden information to reduce the full state of information knowledge. So you weren't just having to know what was happening and your position. You also were unsure of what the position of the other person was. And were they working in conjunction with you or were they working against you? And especially if we're dealing with games that deal with trust, this is a fundamental element of it. I mean, if we look at Mafia, if we look at Werewolf, if we look at uh, Among Us, or even uh, Camelot, uh, Dark Age of Camelot, all of those things, that, that question, the, the tension, the ludo tension, the struggle psychologically in that is whether or not you can trust the person who's doing it. The next thing that we insisted on was that there's no rank in the ring. Uh, this meant that we encouraged people who were taking part in the game to not wear their military uniforms when they were taking part in the game, uh, that they would all wear civilian outfits. And this can be quite important because again, we have that, uh, that instinctive uh, hierarchical structure happening and deference to authority that can be getting in the way of the actual game. The final thing that we insisted on was that the players were, wherever possible, asked not to play the role that they regularly played. And this has served two functions. One, it forced them to consider another person's roles, uh, agendas, uh, agenda and motivations which increases the empathy that the person has with the other roles that they're likely to interface with, thereby hopefully increasing trust. And two, it again reduces that sort of power of the person to turn around and say, uh, uh, to, and say, I'm an authority on this, you should listen to me, you should do it as I decided it should be done, not in the way that you think it should be done. So those were the systems that we employed. Uh, the game itself uh, is scheduled to be run again uh, in September. It was run in May at the Cyber Conflict Conference in Tallinn, and it's also scheduled to be run again in September in the uh, defense, uh, the Swedish Defense University, uh, and also hopefully in October in the uh, in. I keep forgetting the country, uh, in another defense uh, institute in South America. Now, so that's the very, very brief and short introductory overview of uh, the quarterbacking problem and 
a couple of the methods to overcome it. To go into it a little bit deeper, we sadly, please get in touch with me. My contact details are on the slide. And also I have posted the slides to the Discord if anybody wants to reach out to me that way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we'll have time for questions and answer. We already have a couple uh, in the stack. Uh, so thank you. Up next is Noah Steinbach. We have extending wingspan with digital tools, a case study. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, slides are magnified, so they're cut off. Sorry, the, the screen is cut off. Yeah. So whatever. Is that cut off? There we go. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah. I'm going to share a case study with you on extending wingspan with digital tools. So I'm a UX designer in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'm interested in research-driven mobile user experiences, and I currently work at RACB, which is an Australian insurance firm. So as part of my design degree at the University of Melbourne, I got the opportunity to do a capstone research project. Uh, it's not something that's usually done as part of the undergrad program, but I was able to do this project with the great support of my professors, Melissa Rogerson, who's here, and Martin Gibbs. Uh, and just before I get into it, I do want to let you know that it is 2 a.m. here, uh, and this is my first conference ever, so please excuse any slip-ups. So, uh, how do optional digital tools in modern board games enhance gameplay, and how do they challenge the biases involved in the analog digital experience? So how do I get to this research question? Uh, with the rise of digital tools, tabletop gaming has been changing, and it's led to the genre in particular of hybrid digital board games, which require both digital and analog pieces for gameplay to function. But there's a gap in research regarding optional digital tools, and this gap becomes more apparent when we consider the vast digital hinterland, which is the digital presence surrounding material practice of board games. So hobbyists often spend significant amounts of time exploring this online landscape, researching strategies, recording stats and interacting with other players. So we really need to understand who uses optional digital tools and how they are used to enhance gameplay. So we'll explore what features in particular resonate with players. And I feel like this kind of research is invaluable to game developers and board game makers alike. So to better understand optional digital tools, we conducted an artifact review uh, by selecting seven relevant apps that work with the game wingspan. Then through a 28 question survey, we gathered both qual and quant on players' perceptions of digital tools. And we took this blended approach to data analysis in order to get a really well-rounded picture of the whole analog digital experience. We then posted the survey in the wingspan board game group which is a Facebook group uh, with almost 30,000 members. You can see a picture on the right. Uh, and over a week, we got 419 players complete the survey. Uh, I've left the demographics for later in this presentation, which is for a bit of a surprise. So why Wingspan? Wingspan is a really popular one board game designed by Elizabeth Hargrave, where you become a bird conservationist. So what's interesting here is that Wingspan offers multiple ways to play, both physically and digitally. There's also a couple of digital help apps specifically made for Wingspan on the App Store. And so we can see from the different formats available here that the audience, the Wingspan audience already is well-versed in that digital analog sphere. So here in this study, we're gonna define hybrid digital board games as ones that require both digital and analog pieces for gameplay to function. This is the HDB model, which uh, categorizes 41 different functions of digital tools into eight main domains. 
And it is worth noting here that the functions described by the model are independent of technology types. So that brings us to the artifact review. And the reason I showed you that model is because we used it to analyze the optional digital tools in this study. So while all these apps aren't necessary for gameplay in Wingspan, they do form, form part of a more nuanced digital analog experience that's largely been unacknowledged by academia. As you can see here, there's quite a lot of crossover and the layout did get a bit messy, but you can see that the apps cover five of the domains described by the model. You might recognize some of these apps. Uh, the popular ones include Board Game Stats, the Calculator app, of course, and Schwazi. So let's get to what we found out. How do people play Wingspan? We found that generally people prefer the physical board game and that's due to its materiality and social connection. On the other hand, digital Wingspan formats were really popular with around three quarters of our participants having played at least one time. So overall, they said that digital Wingspan helps you overcome certain barriers like COVID-19, of course, distance and having a lack of friends around you to play with. We found that other reasons also included an easier setup uh, with automatic scoring and a ruling process. So first up, we found that scoring features play a really crucial role in making Wingspan easier to play for many users. We found that educational bird themed features were highly rated with many expressing that it added an exciting connection between ornithology, which is the study of birds and the game. However, some saw that as a bit of a novelty element and they wouldn't play it in the long term using uh, the specific app Wing Song here. Uh, board game stats caught our attention because we found it had a small but a really highly dedicated user base uh, within the Wingsan community and that they'd been logging their games for the last four years, every single game. And finally, we found out that people are really reluctant to pay for apps, in particular, if they have a small feature set. But we also found that the app, which is made by Stonemaier, the creator of Wingspan, people were reluctant to pay for that, possibly because they'd already bought the game and spent money on it. Uh, there's a couple of quotes on the right here. Uh, I really like the top one because it shows that digital tools can help make games more accessible to people. This person said, I have a grapheme color synthonesia and I cannot add up in my head. So I need to use a calculator for scoring. So we also asked users about potential future features. We found that practical features like rule clarification were really well received. And also players liked features that enhanced the game's thematics because it added to the overall immersion. Interestingly, players preferred comparing scores within personal groups rather than publicly. And we also found that step-by-step -step scoring instructions were not considered useful. This is possibly just indicating players' familiarity with the game mechanics already. And the general takeaways here are that many users are excited about the potential of digital tools to enhance gameplay, but they do have some concerns about it pulling away from the game. Uh, pulling, pulling away from the game experience, sorry. Uh, we found that this aesthetics and usability were really important as it actually influenced users' perceptions of the entire tool. And additionally, we found that the sheer number of text responses we got in that survey suggests that people are really eager to share their experiences on this. And overall, we found that digital tools do enhance gameplay. So here's the surprise. Remember we had 419 participants in the survey and actually 58% of these identified as women. So this is a really different sample size compared to other studies in the board game world. Our gender distribution also uh, differs quite significantly from Wingspan's general audience. So Stone Meyer, which is the producer of Wingspan, released gender identity distributions of their newsletter subscribers, which is shown to be just about 20% who identified as women and this Facebook group members, which is about 30%. So to try and understand why we got such 
a device diverse participant demographic, I put together what I think we did right in the survey process. I just want to preface that this is highly speculative and I have no idea whether these actually contributed to more women in particular responding to the survey. However, I do think what we did was really good practice. So first of all, the topic was relevant to the group's interests. Uh, obviously, we posted in a wingspan group. Uh, people were really excited to have research done on them. So I think that really drove engagement. Uh, secondly, you can see on the right, that's the image that was posted with the Facebook post. On the bottom of the page is the Facebook post. Uh, it's got really clear ways to engage with it. So it has the QR code, it's got a short URL, and then that short URL also appeared in the Facebook post text. So there were three different ways that people could actually get to the survey. Uh, we had 577 people actually go to that link. So 419 people completing that survey is also a really good amount. Uh, there were also a lot of comments generated on that post. So we found that people, once they had completed the survey, they were going back to the Facebook post and saying, I've just finished this, I'm done, uh, and that they liked the survey and they were excited to find more about what happened, the results. Uh, the last thing is that we also gave users a really diverse uh, gender option range. And we actually had an open text field as well if they wanted to identify as something more personal. They also had the option to not disclose. So why is this important? Well, we think it might be possible in very specific circumstances to attract a more diverse participant group. So this defies some of the stereotypes about people about who plays board games and who engages with them online. People who identify as women and non-binary are historically underrepresented in research. And I think there's still a lot more work to be done in this space. So just to summarize today, overall users were really excited about the development and research of more digital tools for Wingspan in particular. Some had concerns of digital tools pulling users away from that gameplay experience. However, digital tools were overall seen as enhancements to that digital analog experience, but definitely not a necessity. And we think that this research area is also underexplored and hopefully this provides some valuable insights for game and app developers. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Noah. And you did a wonderful job. Um, Thanks, Edwin. Awesome. Again, if you have questions, follow-ups, please put them in the Q&A because I'm just watching the Panel 6 Discord and it's on fire, which is great. So uh, if a question gets posted there, I might get lost. Uh, all right, up next uh, is uh, Leon Xiao uh, with card packs and loot boxes, a biased regulatory contradiction, question mark. You have the stage. Awesome. I'll just give a little bit to uh, share my screen. Sorry, I'm still sharing my honor. Yep, no worries. Sure. All right, there we are. Right, yes. So. Uh, thanks, Edmund, for that uh, introduction. Uh, the title is already being uh, read out. So I'm coming from a more uh, video game uh, perspective onto the sort of uh, tabletop uh, gaming situation. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this mechanic that can be found inside many video games today, known as loot boxes. You can see a screenshot there on the right-hand side. Now, these are virtual items inside video games that players can purchase with real world money to obtain randomized rewards. Most of the time, the player is going to get something that they don't want that is worth very little, but very rarely they will obtain something that they do want and is very valuable. Now, that is to many people conceptually very similar to gambling because the video game player has paid real world money to participate in a randomized process and the result of which is unknown and the values could vary significantly. 
Uh, and quite importantly, uh, loot box purchasing, specifically how much players spend on uh, loot boxes, has been found to be positively correlated with self-reported problem gambling uh, symptomology uh, in quite a few uh, well-replicated uh, empirical studies. Now, this mechanic has been subject to a lot of public controversy and regulatory scrutiny around the world. Now, I'll just show you a quick video of what it looks like to open a loot box. Now, this is uh, a loot box from the game Overwatch. This is a very poor result. This is the minimum that a player would obtain. You'll see that the uh, one rare item is the blue item that just popped out from that loot box there. Now, in contrast, the player could also open a loot box and obtain a better result, like this one, where you can see that in addition to uh, the minimum blue uh, rare reward, this player has also obtained an epic reward. Now, the player would likely be happier, much happier, with this particular result. And of course, the player can also obtain even rare items. But this second video is much rare as uh, compared to the first video. It happens much less often. Now, we uh, come then to the uh, physical uh, car game space. Now, as many of you are, again, well aware, uh, there's this uh, product known as a car pack that is sold as uh, part of the uh, product line for many trading and collectible car games. Uh, for example, Magic the Gathering, as you can see on the uh, right-hand side there. Now, these are physical products uh, with randomized rewards. Again, the player is, of course, buying these with real money. Uh, unlike in video games, you cannot just perform a daily logging uh, to obtain a physical car pack. That doesn't happen. Uh, again, uh, this mechanic is conceptually uh, similar to gambling. Uh, if you visit the uh, communities of many car game players, uh, for example, with Magic the Gathering, you'll find players talking about how uh, the game is, to them, uh, in quotation marks, uh, cardboard crack. Um, however, there's been one study uh, replicating the methodology with the loot box studies, trying to find whether or not there is a link between uh, purchasing car packs, physical car packs, and problem gambling. And they were not able to find a link in that particular study. And in contrast to with loot boxes, there hasn't been quite as much public controversy and regulatory scrutiny of this mechanic. Now, again, I'm going to show you a video of what it looks like to open a pack. You can see you can't see what you're going to get from the pack uh, until you tear it open, and then you can see the results after you open it. Similarly with this example, uh, you tear open the pack, you don't know what's inside, and then the cars come out. Uh, you only know the results once you've purchased the uh, particular pack. Now, if we put these two products side by side, you'll see that there are a lot of similarities. Uh, both uh, are products with randomized rewards. You don't know what you're getting when you decide to spend your money. Uh, secondly, they are, of course, all bought with money. Now, there are loot boxes that you can get without spending money. Similarly, there are car packs that you can uh, get without spending money by participating in events, but we don't really care about those. We focus on the ones that you paid money to buy. And thirdly, both are conceptually similar to gambling. But then it starts to differ when we look at uh, four and five here. Now, firstly, uh, the link doesn't seem to be present with car packs as compared to with loot boxes that link with problem gambling. And then fifthly, it doesn't seem like there is quite as much regulatory scrutiny of uh, car packs as compared to loot boxes. Now I'm gonna focus a bit more on five first, and then I'll come back to point four. Now with whether or not an activity is viewed as gambling uh, within the law, uh, in most countries, there are three elements that must be satisfied uh, for a certain activity or a product to be viewed as, in law, to be gambling. Now, uh, there are some uh, differences uh, depending on which country you're looking at, but uh, a slight oversimplification is presented here. Basically, three elements. So firstly, the player must have paid real world money to participate uh, in purchasing this product or this activity. Secondly, there must be an element of chance. It must be randomized. If there's no randomization, it's obviously not gambling. And then thirdly, which is uh, where the focus sort of is with these products, is the prize. Now, what are you going to get out of the product? Is that thing, that reward or that prize you've obtained, is that worth real world money? Can it be exchanged for real world money? That's usually where the focus is. And with loot boxes, uh, the uh, gambling regulators of many countries have sort of uh, expressed their opinion on what types of loot boxes would in law constitute gambling. And in most countries, the conclusion is that only a very small minority of loot boxes will be gambling. 
those are the loot boxes where the rewards that you obtained inside the video game can be transferred to another player. So it can be sold to another player in exchange for real world money because those loot box rewards are worth real world money. Now, most countries have not enforced the law, even though that is the way the law is, as uh, quite a few video games do indeed have this particular kind of illegal loot boxes within them. However, uh, very recently, Austria, for example, decided to enforce the law and actually decide that, yes, this kind of loot box is illegal gambling, and we're going to uh, try to uh, stop it. So if we are to look at the uh, sort of categorization framework for loot boxes, they can be divided into four types. Uh, depending on whether or not uh, the particular product was paid for with real world money and whether or not the prizes that you obtain from that loot box is or is not worth real world monetary value. Now, we're going to focus on this first type that is seen as gambling, the so-called embedded, embedded type loot boxes where it costed real world money and the rewards have real world value. Now, the issue is car packs are, in my view, physical embedded embedded loot boxes because they satisfy all three elements of gambling there's a stake the player paid real world money to buy the car pack there's a element of chance what you get from the pack is randomized most of the time you're going to get a car that is worth less than the car pack uh, the price that you paid for the car pack but very rarely you're going to get something that is worth more than the car pack and finally the prizes they do have real world monetary value uh, there are very strong secondary markets for all the popular card games. Uh, for example, here with Magic the Gathering, this is a quite recent set. You can see that the cars, the rare cars, do indeed have real-world monetary value, and people do trade and buy and sell them uh, uh, in exchange for real-world money. And uh, as to the point about whether or not car packs were uh, controversial once. They actually were. About 20 or 30 years ago, there were quite a few uh, cases in the US where companies were sued for uh, uh, selling uh, car packs, uh, for uh, trading card games, or even just for the uh, uh, collectible baseball cards. And in one of the cases, um, it, it was even said that, yes, the chase cards do indeed the rare cars do have uh, a value, a monetary value on the secondary market, such that it is possible that they are illegal gambling. However, all of those claims failed, but that was actually on uh, uh, legal technicality, which I'm not going to go into today. But the point is that it is quite likely, and in my view, it is the right interpretation of the law to say the car packs uh, are at least arguably illegal gambling. However, not much has been done since then, and there doesn't seem to be much controversy uh, with car packs in Europe uh, or in other parts of the world. Now, in my opinion, there's a bit of an industry discrimination going on. Um, I think video game companies are quite justified to point towards the car packs and to say that if car packs are not regulated as gambling, then you cannot come after the loot boxes inside video games because there needs to be consistency when the law is applied because we're looking literally at the same section of gambling law. If you're going to apply it to the video game context, then you also need to apply it to the physical uh, car context. Unless, of course, there can be some sort of justification for why uh, these two products are treated differently. Now, before I turn to that question, I will just quickly uh, show you this very recent quote from the uh, Belgian gambling regulator published uh, September 2022. It seems that uh, with some intervention from the academic side, uh, gambling regulators have recognized that actually, yes, the trading card packs are the same as loot boxes inside video games. And if there is to be regulation, both products need to be treated the same way because conceptually they're the same and in law they are the same. Now, let's come back to that question. Now, is there some justification for treating these two products differently? And uh, the most prominent justification at the moment is that loot box spending is positively correlated with problem gambling. This has been consistently replicated many times, and I think the academic literature accepts that this is a relationship that exists. However, with car pack spending, one study found that there was no positive correlation between the two activities. Um, importantly, this is uh, the only study that's ever been conducted on this topic, and I think uh, there are quite a few issues with that study. But um, in any case, if there is no correlation or if there's no evidence of a robustly strong correlation between car pack spending and problem gambling, then there is indeed weaker support for regulating car packs as gambling. Now, 
Um, I would just like to highlight three uh, uh, weaknesses with that original uh, study on car packs. Uh, the first point was that that particular study asked how much players spent on car packs. But this is um, actually, it's, it's not the same in the physical car game context as it is in the loot box context. Uh, if you ask a video game player how much they spent on loot boxes, that is a sensible question because the only use for loot boxes is to open them to get random rewards. But with car packs, there are actually other uses. For those products you can for example uh, participate uh, in some uh, formats of the game where it is only possible if you go uh, and play that game with sealed car packs if you participate in those activities it is quite likely that they are less gambling like than simply opening the pack and trying to obtain rare and valuable cars so that might explain why there was no evidence of a relationship there because that question was posed in a rather unspecific way now, um, that study also did not ask participants about loot box spending. So we don't actually know whether or not the relationship between loot box spending and problem gambling would have uh, arisen in that particular sample. It is possible that card game players are just very savvy. Uh, one potential uh, explanation uh, that I might posit is that because there is such a strong secondary market, players always know that they will lose money if they open car packs. So maybe uh, card game players are just uh, very wise and they don't uh, open car packs in a gambling-like manner. And then thirdly, another issue with that study is it was conducted uh, in mid-January. Um, in, I think, uh, 2020. So uh, basically, and it asks about how much uh, players spent on car packs in the past month. Uh, so that period was quite special. We included Christmas time. And we know that, of course, physical car game products release periodically and player spending might not be consistent uh, throughout the year. So depending on when you ask, it might not have been a good period to ask. And also including Christmas might have caused the results to be uh, quite uh, unique. So uh, basically, uh, we are planning on running a survey of 2,000 participants as a registered report to try to replicate and extend on Zendo et al. I will be very happy to hear your thoughts on ways that we can improve on that uh, study by Zendo et al. Uh, and I think it's very important for research to take into account the experience of people with lived experience to actually involve players who play these games uh, to participate in the research process. So we don't ask questions like, how much did you spend on car packs? As if that is a valid question to ask that would give you very good results. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, happy to discuss questions uh, after uh, the next presentation. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting. There's some uh, side chatter uh, on uh, Discord if you want to take a look. Um, and last up, I think everyone's coming in a little under time, which is awesome. So a lot of time for, a lot of time for Q&A uh, is Melissa Rogerson, who is presenting for the whole team. Uh, I'll let them introduce uh, the paper is exploring the mechanisms of hybrid digital play. Take it away. Hi. Hi, everybody. So my name is Melissa Rogerson. I'm a lecturer and board game researcher at the University of Melbourne, and my discipline is human computer interaction. So um, I guess I'm less interested in reading games as text and more interested in the way that they allow us to play and the way that they are played. I know it's usual to put acknowledgements at the end of a paper, but I really wanted to put them up front and acknowledge the work of Damon, who did most of the classification work that I'm describing here, and of Lucy, who's been with me on this journey into hybrid games almost from the start, and especially to acknowledge the contribution of Game In Lab, who funded this work, as well as my earlier project looking at hybrid games. And that funding's currently open for proposals till the 30th of August. So I really encourage you to consider applying to them if you have a great project in need of some support. Now, there are lots of definitions of hybrid and lots of other terms that are used alternately. Um, when we developed our hybrid game model, we resisted using words like augmented um, because augmented somehow suggests that the technology element is just bolted on somehow to an otherwise complete game and that it might also somehow automatically make the game better. Um, and obviously we would contest that. There are definitely terrible hybrid games, just as there are some pretty terrible board games too. Um, 
And we recognise, as Noah outlined earlier, in fact, that there are lots of parts of play that always use technology. So whether you're using board game stats to track plays or the Chiwazi finger chooser to select a first player, or even just using smartphones to arrange and coordinate game night. Um, and there are lots of ways that games can optionally use technology. But for this work, uh, we're really focused on that first definition of games that require both the physical components and the smart technology. And we first looked at these games in around 2020 and we made that graph on the left and we found that the number of these games was growing rapidly and that's a trend that's continued. You can probably see if you look closely that we use slightly different data for this second chart. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but either way, the number of games in this category has more than doubled since 2020 and it's continuing to grow. This yellow area on the second graph really highlights that continued growth. And I know it seems to flatten out a little bit, but that's because we only have data from three months of 2023 in our corpus so far. So, you know, it's not really going to flatten out, I'm, I'm confident. In our earlier work, we were interested to find out what function these smart technologies played in games. What were designers doing with them? What were they doing in the context of play? And so we surveyed a few hundred people, we looked at lots of games, we interviewed some game professionals, designers, publishers and others, and we developed this model where we conceptualise 41 different functions that digital technology performs in hybrid digital board games. So this is the overall view of the model. And then for each of those eight kind of domains, we actually articulate what is done within that domain. So this is the housekeeping domain. It's about choosing and tracking components and configurations. And of course, you know, we haven't developed exhaustive lists of all of the games that use these functions, um, but we, we do in that paper use some illustrative examples to help people to understand what those functions are useful for, what they're doing from the play perspective. But this work got us wondering whether there was an overlap between the functions that we'd identified and the core mechanisms of the game and what the sort of landscape of games that have these hybrid functions in them looks like. Um, in some cases, there's a really obvious connection, right? A game can't really use a storytelling function unless there's some kind of storytelling mechanism. Um, but we thought maybe the link might be less obvious in some other cases. And, and I'll say here, um, there's a lot of numbers in this presentation, which is very unusual for me. So um, hopefully they all make sense um, along the way. Now, fortunately for us, a lot of that classification work had already been done. So Board Game Geek classifies games according to the building blocks outlined in, in that book by um, Jeff Engelstein and Isaac Shallard. So for example, Flamecraft, not a hybrid, is classified as having these five mechanisms. Now, of course, this is crowdsourced user-generated content. We know that it won't always be perfect, but it's the most authoritative source that we have. And importantly, it exists as a data source. So it's something that we can actually take on board and analyze. And the other thing that exists on Board Game Geek is this family of games that they call digital hybrid app or website required. When I checked it yesterday, there were 554 games, so definitely some that aren't yet in our database. Um, and again, this is crowdsourced data. So there are some inconsistencies and there will be things that are missing. Um, one that I, I think is, is really um really prominent is that Alchemists is listed as one of the top games, um, but it actually violates the first listed exclusion there that it does have a fully cardboard way to play, um, although it's a bit bit clunky. Um, so again, you know, this data, not perfect, but it exists. And our decision to use this classification, this family of games as the starting point for this study is why, if you remember our earlier slide, we have slightly more games here than we looked at in our 2021 paper. So we downloaded all of this data, right, the name, the year of the game, the rankings, um, as well as the mechanisms that it was identified as using, and we broke it out. So we had an enormous spreadsheet 
um, there are 488 games, pardon me, in the database. And the first thing that we looked at was prevalence. So how often did the different mechanisms occur in this data set compared to overall in BGG in all of the, I don't know, 400,000 or so games that are classified? So we started by looking at those overall numbers, right? Um, and there are only 48 mechanisms that are actually used by more than 1% of the games in the database. I doubt that anyone will be surprised that the most prevalent mechanism is dice rolling. Um, so for this presentation, I've just focused on the top 20, um, the 20 most prevalent uh, mechanisms. And you can see that dice rolling occurs in nearly 26% of the games on BGG. And then there's a big gap to hand management, 14%. And our next step was to generate that same data for the hybrid games that we'd identified. And as you can see, the list here looks really quite different. Um, so if I go through some of those comparisons, right? Um, dice rolling, not as common. Hand management, much less. Roll, spin and move. Variable player powers and set collection. Um, it's actually the 31st most common um, mechanism in hybrid games. So you can see it goes from five to, to 31. And there are 56 mechanisms that are used by more than 1% of the games in our sample. Um, again, a very long tail and only about 110 of 192 mechanisms appear at all. So only a little over half of the mechanisms are actually being used in hybrid games. And if we if we look the other way, right, um, cooperative game is about seventh in the overall mechanisms. It's number one by a whopping 60.5% in the hybrid games. And storytelling doesn't even appear in our top 20 but um, for overall, but it's very popular in the hybrid family. And this chart highlights some of those differences. Essentially, anything over the dotted line is overrepresented in the hybrid group compared to overall, and anything under the line occurs more frequently in the overall pool of games than in our hybrid selection. And we're using a log scale here just to spread the responses out a bit, but you know, generally, the further away something is from that blue dotted line, the greater the difference in prevalence that we saw. And in fact, there are only nine mechanisms that appear on both of the top 20 lists. And so we asked ourselves whether there was like a reason for this. So for example, most of the hybrid games we looked at were published in the last 10 years, but some of these mechanisms in the, um, in the BGG list are maybe considered a bit old fashioned, right? Like hex grids, obviously hexagons are the best of guns, but you know, we don't see them as as much perhaps in newer games as we did in older games and action points. And maybe deck bag and pool building is new, right? Um, but then when we look at those other, other, um, other mechanisms, role-playing, team-based games and push your luck mechanisms, they're, they're nothing new, but yet they're much more prevalent in these games. And so this is where we turn to start looking at the hybrid games themselves. Now, 488 games were a few too many for us to review in detail, so we restricted our sample to the games that were actually ranked on BGG, and that gave us 144 games to look at. And of those, there were lots and lots of similar games. So um, the three games, I think, in the Echoes range or a whopping 37 Unlock titles and a lot of other um, uh, a lot of other escape room-themed games in this category. So we ended up looking in detail at 87 games, and this is where Damon worked really hard. He reviewed the rules and video tutorials for these games to see which of the functions and domains in our model they really used. And through this process, he really made us think about our model in new and sometimes quite confronting ways, right? What are we doing here? Which of these, um, which of these functions are we actually delivering? And we also tracked down copies of about 30 of these games um, borrowing a question to Leon earlier, yes, my university did pay for most of them. Um, and we played all or part of them and we added those assessments as well. So our spreadsheet kept growing. Sorry, I'll just go back. And you can see here, we've got this 
split, right? 52% of the games we looked at used some kind of timing function. Interestingly, only 10% used randomizing. There was actually more likely to be kind of selecting from a pool of pre-generated um, setups rather than completely generating something randomly. And the most prevalent hybrid functions were from this storytelling domain. On average, the games that we assessed used about seven different functions from our model. Um, just for interest, the game with a whopping 18 hybrid functions was World of Yoho, where you actually use your smartphone as your playing piece on the board. So a few observations, right? What's interesting about this? Um, we've got some top functions, things that appear most frequently, and this is those detailed functions rather than at the domain level. Um, but we also had some functions that we didn't see at all, like rolling dice, customizing pieces or characters, and even using stats to see which cards are better. This is something we know that game designers and publishers do behind the scenes rather than um, publishing that information for players. So broadly speaking, what have we learned? Well, obviously hybrid games are different from other games, but they're much more different than we expected. Um, the existence of those big families of games like the Unlock games and Escape Room games doesn't explain all of those differences, but maybe they do explain, you know, some of them, and that the most innovative games don't use the most hybrid functions. Um, and also that there's a bit of a design challenge there for people to expand the different types of hybrid games that are being developed and introduce some of these underused functions. And then we've got some open questions too about how do those specific hybrid functions correlate to game mechanisms, specifically at a game level? Um, are people just following the successful models, right? Escape room games, unlock games, rather than pursuing innovation and novelty? And finally, my favourite question, what do designers and publishers think? So thank you very much. You can see more information on our website. And I did upload a copy of the slides to the panel six um, area on Discord. And of course, if you want to find us in the mess that social media is now, there is a big long list of where you can find us. So thank you very much. Really great. And everyone on time. So we have a good solid half hour for questions. Um, a number are already stacking up uh, in the uh, queue. So I will get to them uh, as we go. I might jump around just so that everyone has a chance to answer something. Um, really interesting. I'm just sort of trying to think through the thread that I'm seeing through all the papers. And um, there is something about I guess, like perceptions of and or the ways that, you know, certain mechanics are handled in all of your talks, I think, I think are really interesting to sort of think about and whether or not something is useful or seen as problematic is, is a thread that I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, so Joe asks for, um, uh, Heather, uh, do you have the reverse of quarterbacking, the reverse of a quarterbacking player? Uh, I find that less experienced players can overly rely on more experienced players afraid of making decisions and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm sure you would find that situation happening, but uh, it wouldn't be as prominent in these sort of games that I'm uh, working with. Because I'm working with games that are more in the war game and the training environment, a lot of the people are coming in with expectations of behaving in a particular way. So they're less likely to do it. Uh, you also have to differentiate between the natural progression of a noob player uh, who is just getting to grips with the rule set and is learning to get to grips with the rule set versus a player who has some experience and enough experience to be able to engage with the game and is choosing not to engage with the game. If they're choosing not to engage with the game and they're just saying, tell me what you want me to do, then are they really playing the game or are they playing to borrow from uh, from uh, the 
Jane McGonagall, are they really playing the are they really playing the game or are they playing the game of pleasing the person who they're attempting to please? Are they playing golf or are they playing the please don't shoot me game? So yeah, I would see it as potentially being slightly less toxic and definitely less of a risk for the sort of cooperative uh, seminar and creative games that are being used in a lot of the educational contexts. Hopefully that answered the question. Great. Um, just two really quick follow maybe not quick, but two quick follow-ups I saw in chat much earlier, uh, thinking about the fact that you're doing training games and whether or not this idea of like getting people to play and not feel or see or understand that there is some form of like real world risk or this is about promotion or this is about war like how does that impact what you're trying to do and then there's a question from an attendee about do you see this quarterbacking map onto other dynamics like race gender sexuality citizenship that sort of thing uh well let's let's deal with the elephant in the room in the room <laughs> which is the the quintessential question of what makes a game a game um I'm a, I'm a structuralist at heart. I am a Sweetsian structuralist. I believe a game has four components, uh, goals, rules, feedback system, and voluntary participation. If it has those four components, I classify it as a game. I am not interested in the huge amount of debate surrounding those issues and dealing with it. Uh, I did at one stage write a chapter for a book that unfortunately hasn't got published where I identified six different arguments and types of arguments for what a game is, which would summarize all of those different positions. When it comes to games having real world consequences, all games have real world consequences. The, the idea that a game has no consequences doesn't make sense to me. There is always going to be a consequence of play. It's just that the consequence of play is reduced when in comparison with doing it in real life. So I'm dealing with cybersecurity training games where people are preparing for cybersecurity incidents or attacks or potentially cyber warfare. It, doing it in a training and in-game environment means that they are more willing to be creative, take risks, and explore that problem space than doing it in real world. Because, yeah, uh, if doing it in a real world, people tend to be inherently more conservative. So uh, in my gameplay experience with the various people, I've seen both conservative forms of play and more experimental forms of play inside in the same game, happening, coexisting from different teams. So yes, uh, to get back to the point, uh, does do training games and do things have real world significance? Yes, they do, but so do flight, sim flight simulators. The skills that you learn in a flight simulator hopefully translates into the skills that you would need in a real world scenario. Okay, the next question, which hopefully I'm going to be less meandering on, is do uh, gender uh, identity and other politics impact, uh, impact quarterbacking? Definitely. Any power dynamic situation. The primary power dynamic that I identified was much more based around the concept of expertise. But unfortunately, expertise can be masked by confidence. And uh, speaking as a white male, uh, sometimes this can be uh, a thing that is unfortunately mistaken, uh, competence being mistaken for loudness. And this can be incredibly problematic in the design. What I noticed and what I saw in the design of both the games was the method to deal with these situations wasn't to attempt to educate the player, but was to design the system in such a way that it promoted a different form of play. A, it encouraged a play in this direction or that it discouraged these specific behaviors. 
And by doing so, you help to create a more leveling of the environmental area, which is important in these sort of games. Does this have implication for future game design theories? Yes. And it was very pleasing to see uh, Megan's uh, presentation looking at the, uh, the encyclopedia of uh, game mechanics, because looking at the game mechanics can understanding the game mechanics that you're using can help you to shape the experience in the way that you want the experience to take place. And I'm going to stop talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think that's the thing is, right? Like, you know, mechanic, you know, instead of teaching the player about, oh, you know, gender, you know, politics or racial politics or whatever, you're trying to use the mechanics to do different things. But we could also argue that that's teaching players to think about those things, perhaps. In yes, uh, it's experiential learning versus uh, versing versus declarative learning. Right. Uh, and as we not... learn from a lot of the other panels, I think there's a mm -hmm. lot to the like pre-briefing, I'm going to invent that word, and debriefing. Mm -hmm. Oh, deep, debriefing, is this, debriefing is essential. Uh, if you think of games primarily as experiential units, uh, if, if we think of them in Kolb's learning cycle, the debrief is actually where the learning takes place. The debrief is where the reflection takes place. And I did post in the Discord a link to a framework for debriefing war games, which I think should be used a hell of a lot more in learning game environments, and potentially even in debriefing playtesting for board games and those sort of games as well. Great. Um, I'm going to do a suite of questions for, I think, Leon. Um, so Brian is asking, are there examples of digital loot box to analog game? For example, do you expect Wizards of the Coast to introduce micro transactions uh, through D&D Beyond to tabletop D&D? &D? Uh, and then thinking about the highest spending Magic the Gathering players, I suspect don't buy card packs as their primary expenditure, rather they go to the secondary market. And then lastly, did you get funding to buy loot boxes and booster packs? Uh, no, uh, I, I I did not get funding uh, to open. <laughs> people, fortunately, that's quite funny because I I did this study in Belgium where uh, I had to go and find whether or not games contain loot boxes. Had I actually paid money, I would have committed a crime in Belgium because it's a crime to knowingly participate in illegal gambling. Most people will never get caught uh, for it because they wouldn't know it's illegal gambling. But as a researcher, you do know, so you can't pay for the loot boxes in Belgium. But anyway, uh, <laughs> with the DND uh, one, uh, unfortunately, I'm not very familiar with the DND situation, but I, I have found one product which I thought was quite interesting. It's um, so. Nintendo has this uh, game called Animal Crossing, and uh, they released a version of it for the Nintendo Switch. And uh, it is possible to, in real life, go and buy car packs, physical car packs, that will give you rewards inside the game. I, I, I'm going to call them rewards because that's the easiest way to think about it. But uh, of course, what you get in the physical car packs are randomized. Um, so it, it, they, so the game, the video game, doesn't contain loot boxes, but their loot boxes are physical car packs that you buy uh, outside of the game. This is quite interesting because then if uh, for example, in a country where loot boxes are um, ha heavily regulated, they do not have to comply if uh, instead they're offering that mechanic through a physical product. So I, I thought that was a quite interesting interplay. Probably doesn't answer your D&D question, which someone else uh, might be able to uh, answer. And yes, a very good point about the highest spending players. Now, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, with a video game where you can't just go and buy the things you want, then you are forced if you want to spend a lot of money or you're just very investing in the game to keep buying loot boxes because that's the only way to spend money and get the things you want. But with a strong secondary market, yes, you can just be a lot smarter about it and just go buy the things directly rather than engaging with the car packs. So um, it, it's quite interesting that with gambling law that um, they would find the products with a secondary market to be worse because they are in law illegal gambling. But this might actually somehow be a protective factor rather than something that makes the product worse. I, I think that's a very interesting point that uh, we hope to explore in the future. Thank you. Uh, question for Melissa and, and Noah, maybe. Um, 
Uh, this is saying, how much is storytelling in hybrid board games connected with the activity of reading fairly small text on a light blue screen? Or perhaps, you know, maybe broader, like, you know, how have you found that the story, you know, I saw on that list storytelling was important, right? And so how does that play out? So there are lots of different ways that um, people people have implemented storytelling. Sadly, there is, you know, way too much just reading from a crappy screen. Mm -hmm. um, there are also things like cutscenes, right, which we think of from video games. Interestingly, I, I think that often they're more annoying than actually kind of useful, um, but there will be a recording of somebody speaking. So if we think about a game like Chronicles of Crime, for example, um, when you, you're you trying to solve a, a murder, you go and talk to somebody and it will actually play kind of a recording of somebody going, well, you know, I saw them at four o'clock this afternoon. Um, and, and, you know, that's a part of the storytelling as well. So um, there, there are these kind of cutscene recordings, which I think are possibly as annoying as the... Um, as that you have to read this from a screen, but there are other ways that the storytelling, you know, can evolve as well that are maybe a little bit less um, intrusive or annoying. I mean, I think it's related to that function of like, you know, using the tools as a way to facilitate the gameplay so that you can stay in the game as opposed to cutscenes obviously are in the game, but they pull you out because you have to loaded or do that sort of thing yeah yeah and if I can jump in somebody's also asked a question kind of about that how much does do these digital tools take you out of the game um I hate to be that person who says well we wrote about this in a paper in 2021 but you know we wrote about it in a paper in 2021 called more than a gimmick where we actually did some interviews with people working in the industry and one of the things that they were absolutely absolutely clear on was that the purpose of the app is to bring you back to the board and um, and that sort of mature understanding that you don't want the app to be taking you away from the board and, and creating a, a, an environment where everybody's sitting looking at their phones. You actually want the focus to remain always on the board. Our uh, Discord um, experts are linking to it right now. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let's see. All right. A couple more questions for Melissa, but people weigh in however you would like. This one's very long. I'll try to condense it. Um, as someone who has recently fell down the rabbit hole of Mansions of Madness and its wealth of player-created content, we've noticed a dynamic that occurs exclusively within uh, DHG, the attention redirection that occurs from physical equipment. We, we talked about this a little bit. Um, We've somehow mitigated this by casting the tablet screen to a nearby television that everyone can easily see at once, but ultimately one player still needs to run the app and that takes their attention away from the table. Has your research uncovered any observations about how digital hybrids might be negatively disrupting the attention economy of board gaming? So we've talked about that already a little bit. Um, if there's more that people want to add, uh, great. Uh, and then the next one is for these hybrid games, what are your thoughts on their longevity or archivability, particularly concerned when there are mechanics that are necessarily for play that might go under if a company stops supporting them or, you know, think about like all of the technology platforms that have deplatformed or, you know, basically disappeared. Um, I still lament flash games, um, you know, to this day. So, yeah. Um people people that I interviewed um as as people working in the industry but of course people who work in the industry are often enthusiasts as well um were still really bitter about Golem Arcana servers going under so this um this is a real concern um but one of the things that the the people said to me consistently was think about you know think about all the games on your shelves and think about how many times you played each of them and about how often they come out. And their argument, and again, this is in that more than a gimmick paper, their argument is that usually you play a game within about the first year that it comes out and you might go back to it later, um, but generally it gets that peak of play straight away. So maybe it doesn't matter 
Um, maybe not every game has to be, you know, that that family heirloom that you inherit from your grandmother or something, um, which which is a really important thing in games, right? But but maybe not every game has to be that. Maybe games can can be kind of temporary, and we've seen that, right? In um, exit games where you're actually physically cutting up the pieces, you can only play that game once. So. You know, we've got a bit of um, a bit of sensitization to this idea that maybe a game's not always forever. I'll say I hate that, right? I want all my games to be forever. All of my games are important antiques, but you know, as as a researcher, I can go, yeah, okay, maybe maybe that's okay. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, uh, Maka on Discord is like you know folks who don't like hybrid games because they won't work after the apocalypse is that a real concern i mean i think that's you know a lot of these sorts of things right you have a battery for this i mean i think about my own conversations about teaching students and them reading on screens as opposed to reading with the book right and sometimes i talk about this sort of tension between you know what happens if your kindle isn't charged or you know that sort of stuff um all right, a couple of questions for back to loot boxes. I know we're jumping around. Uh, Jonas asks, has the rarity slots appeared in your research as an excuse for card packs not being loot boxes? Um, and then someone on, on chat uh, saying, is Pokemon Go loot boxing for good? And I'm not sure what that means. But... Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the uh, rarity uh, slot is about, but uh, if, if I have to... Uh... Uh, sort of uh, conjecture about it. I I, I know that um, the ESRB uh, in US and Canada they like to argue that loot boxes uh, are not gambling because you are always guaranteed to get something. Uh, that that's the uh, argument. I I don't think it's a very good argument, and the law will not accept it because it is quite obvious that the player is not paying for the minimum guarantee content, which is worth very little, if anything. That what they're paying for is the random chance to get better stuff. So I, I don't think that argument will stand. Uh, uh, and with the uh, other question about Pokemon Go, uh, I also don't quite understand the question. Uh, happy to answer it uh, in, in the Discord later. But I think it's quite interesting with Pokemon Go that I know that, for example, there is the egg and incubator mechanic uh, as a loot box. And uh, Niantic, the company behind Pokemon Go, does not recognize that as a loot box. So they're not making probability disclosures, which they are required to do. I also know that there's the ray pass mechanic where you can pay money to have a random chance while well, to, to basically fight an enemy. And if you do defeat that enemy, you have a random chance of getting a shiny or a rare version of that Pokemon. Uh, only a chance. Um, and they have not disclosed what that chance would be for the shiny to appear. Um, things like that. Uh, so it's kind of sort of uh, at the edge of what is where it's not a loot box uh, but i think uh, regulators tend to want to apply a broader uh, definition and so even if it does not look like a box if it's some sort of randomized in-game purchasing mechanic then they would uh, try to regulate it yeah i mean i think there's an earlier conversation that i sort of posed like there is this and this relates to sort of the technology hybrid all these sorts of things right like you know, our attitudes toward and assumptions about materiality or material things versus digital things is still being, is still, you know, in a kerfuffle, uh, for it culturally. And I think that the, perhaps the loot boxes in video games is like, you're not getting actually anything, whereas like card packs, you're actually getting a thing. That thing might be useless, but it's still a thing, right? Um, and, you know, and I think that's the thing, a lot of times people sort of react to it. And then I think the other thing is obviously who, the, who are these being targeted towards? Um, and, you know, we've heard all the horror stories of, you know, the six-year-old who's just on parent's phone and is just like buying stuff without realizing that they are buying stuff, right? And so those tensions are there. Uh, question for Noah uh, about the comments on the Facebook thread for Wingspan. Is there anything else to add about how people engage with the study or, you know, I guess, yeah, just if anything surprised you or if anything um, uh, really came out that you might want to comment on? Yeah, so uh, I had a social media background uh, before I did uni. So I worked a couple of years doing kind of like marketing things. Uh, so when I approached this, I was really careful with that 
that post in general. And I have two friends in that wingspan group and I actually got them to also comment on that post as soon as it went up. And that was just to kind of start building traction. Cause I mean, that's how Facebook works. If, if something in a group starts getting traction early on, it kind of snowballs. So that was my goal and it seemed to work. Amazing. Anything surprising that sort of, or a, a funny story that came out of, I'm always, I don't do this kind of research. So I'm always really interested in like, when you have to like ask people for answers and they just treat, you know, your survey as like Yelp, right? Like it's. <laughs> I, I think it was really positive overall. Like it was surprisingly uh, quick how many people caught onto the survey. Uh, Melissa and I were talking beforehand and we thought it's either going to get like 10 responses or 300 responses and it went to the upper part. <laughs> Always amazing. Um, great. Any other questions? I know, I know, you know, day two is always a little bit of a slowdown for everyone. And we're coming upon, you know, second breakfast for some people. Well, I have the floor. I'm, I've been prompted, you know, in my earpiece to remind everyone about the social at the end of the day. Uh, bring your beverage, snack, pet of choice, and uh, we will just hang out, totally informal, open it up, everyone can chat. Um, it'll be good. Any questions that the presenters want to ask one another? like no okay i'm busy uh, answering the questions in discord <laughs> great perfect awesome um i am not against ending a little bit early so let me um you know break the table and uh say that we will call this um fini everything uh, thank you everyone a found final round of applause for all applause for all of our presenters um, we'll have a break for about 38 minutes and return for yet another D, &D panel. So uh, thank you everyone. Great session and take care. Thank you very much.